Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist, and today I've been experimenting with the new repeat nodes that they've added to Blender 4.0 in the alpha version. And so in the process of experimenting with that, um, what I've ended up with is this rock generator node group, which sort of iteratively displaces the mesh and increases the resolution of a retopology. And this is the result that you get after doing that. So it's pretty cool because you can roughly direct it by modeling some shape, but then you can use the rock generator to turn that mesh into a much more detailed piece that you could um, retopologize and bake textures to or something. But um, it's also, you can randomize the seed and get a different result. So I thought I'd go through the node group and sort of show some of how I was able to use the repeat zones when I think that could be useful and when not maybe. Um, I don't really know yet. I feel like a lot of the things that you could do, like, um, I don't know if anyone saw the Blender Today live stream where they first showed it off. Uh, Pablo made like sort of a array node using it, which was cool in the small number of nodes that was needed to make it. And while I haven't actually tested it, I would have to imagine that using the repeat zone would be a lot slower than creating a bunch of points and then instancing on the points. Um, simply because he said that the re repeat zone currently has to run uh, serially. It can't do any of the processing in parallel. So then it really sort of just fills the same hole that the simulation zone um, could also do, but with the added benefit that you don't have to simulate the scene to find the result, it just it can happen instantly. So that's a pretty huge improvement in and of itself, if you're not trying to animate something, if you just want to generate a single static mesh. So I guess the first thing I can show is this Musgrave loop that I know that I made, where it takes the, a Musgrave texture and iteratively adds it to itself to make a more detailed texture. I wouldn't say this is, you know, a vastly improved texture to end all textures or anything like that, but it's an interesting technique that you could use to get results that are different than what you would get with just a standard single texture. So if we take a look at this here, you can see we have a repeat zone. Um, into the repeat zone, we put the number of iterations we want, which I think was set to four or six, I guess. And then we have the value, which is the value of like a pixel or a point in the texture. And then we have this integer, which is like the index uh, in the loop that we are. So that integer comes in and we add one to it every frame and then pass it back into the integer. And then the value comes in, we're going to create a Musgrave texture and then add that Musgrave texture to the value. And the, the sum of those goes into the value, which loops back around. And we add a new instance of the Musgrave texture onto it. And we do that for as many steps as there are iterations. And then to control it over time, we have um, the seed that comes in. And we mix that with the index of the iteration to get a different W val value for the Musgrave texture. And then if we take the iteration index and divide it by the total number of iterations, we get a value between 0 and 1, which we can map to a float curve to control things like the scale of the texture over time. So for this example here, um, we have this float curve. We have six iterations, so we'll start here um, where the scale of the texture is um, very small, like 0 0.01, um, which will mean we'll just have a sort of a smooth gradient, and then we'll do another iteration, and the value will be slightly higher, and we'll get a few more shapes in it, and then we go all the way up until, until we add a very detailed pass over the top. So we're sort of just layering up the details. At least that was the idea. And then I also experimented with running the index of the iteration into a power node. So that number will start small at one and then exponentially increase. And using that value to feed into a snap node to sort of control the number of grayscale values in each layer. So it starts with only two and then it would increase up until there were quite a few. And then it and then at the end, we can divide the result of adding all of those different Musgrave textures together by the number of textures we added to get a value that's in the usable range again. So that's a smaller building block that uses the repeat zone. And the reason that's cool is that if you wanted to do that previously, instead of having the six iterations, you would have had to have six different Musgrave texture nodes that you added together. Because um, there's no way to adjust the settings of the Musgrave texture like on the fly per index, I don't think. So then we have the rock generator itself. If we were to go through these nodes, first thing we have is our input geometry that allows you to make a shape that you think is cool and then um, have the rocks be in roughly the same shape when, it, when the output result is calculated. And then um, the first thing we could do to that is just allow you to, to distort it a little bit. So we have a set position node where we just take a random 
noise texture that's with a very, very small size, and add that to the position of the vertices controlled by this distort input value so we can control how distorted it gets. That's more useful if you just like add a cube or something and you want to be able to duplicate that cube five different times, randomize the seeds, and then get different kinds of shaped rocks out of it. Then the next thing we could do is we could run this geometry through a process to add rock-like details to it. And there's probably a lot of different ways you could do that. So then the first thing I wanted to do was, um, since I wanted to make sort of rock formations that were sitting on or you know coming up out of the ground, I wanted to be able to sort of expand the bases of the rock formations. So we do that here with this set position node. First thing we're going to do is to look at the Z position of all the vertices. And if the Z position is close to or below zero, then we'll mask those out and create a value that basically says this is the bottom of this rock formation. And then we can use that as a scalar for the normal of the, um, of the, of the faces to push all of the vertices out a little bit from their starting position. And so the result of that just looks like this. You can see the bottom expands a little bit. Then the next thing I wanted to do was just sort of prevent it from going below the ground. That isn't strictly necessary, but um, I just clamped the position of the vertices to zero. They couldn't be less than zero. So that's all this is. Um, look at the Z. If the Z is less than zero, use the XY coordinates, but set Z to zero. Then I made this cool little node group that fills this the volume of this mesh with hexagons. And that looks like this. And the point of that was just to break up the smoothness of the shape a little bit and add some sort of large details to it. And the way we're able to do that is to take the input geometry and separate the faces based on their normal. So we get all of the faces that are pointing more or less down and separate those from all of the faces that are pointing sideways or up. And then on those faces that are pointing down, I instance a bunch of points like this. And then what we can do with those points is we can sample the nearest surface from the what was not selected, so this part of the mesh excluding the downward faces. And then what we can do is we can figure out the distance between our, our new point that we created and the nearest point on the, the mesh that was not selected as being downward facing. And so we can do that by taking the position and subtracting that from the position of the nearest surface. We can get the length of that vector. And then we can just clamp that to be within a minimum and a maximum range. And we can set that to be the scale of our instances. And the instances are just circles with six vertices, which is a hexagon. And then um, the scale vector is ones scaled to the distance to the nearest surface point, which gives us this. A bunch of hexagons. The ones that are more towards the center are, can be larger. If they get close to the edge, they're smaller, so that a hexagon won't really expand beyond the boundary of those faces, which I guess we could see if we joined the original faces in. None of these should none of these hexagons should be outside of these original faces too much. I guess they are a little bit, um, especially these ones that are at a slope. But um, in general, that was the idea. So then we can realize those instances. Um, each of these is a single face because they're n-gons. And then we can just extrude those faces um, out. And the distance we want to extrude them, we can calculate by taking, again, our the inverse of our downward facing selection and using that as the target of a raycast node where we raycast in the normal direction of our new hexagons that we created. And then the distance that that raycast goes is how far we should extrude. And then after we've done that, we can join because um, there's no bottoms to these. We can join the original hexagon back in with it to get the bottoms back, and then we can merge by distance to make it a single waterproof mesh. And that is the fill with hexagons node. So then I have a switch because I don't want to fill with hexagons every single time, or we'll never get any sort of rock-like details. So it does that for the first two passes of the iterations of the rock generator, and then after that, um, it seemed like three or four iterations was giving the nicest results. So with three, you can still sort of see that the blockiness of the hexagon shapes. And with four, everything smooths out quite a bit more. So to limit that, I just have the index going into this less than node. If the index is less than two, we'll use the fill with hexagons. And otherwise, we'll just use the original geometry. These hexagons are all intersecting each other. And I want to get rid of that. So I put the that mesh into a mesh to volume node. 
which looks like this. And then that immediately goes into a volume to mesh node, which sort of does a voxel retopology of the mesh and deletes all of the interior faces. Now the voxel size of the mesh to volume node controls the resolution of this. So if we turn this down, it gets much more high resolution. And if you turn it up, it gets lower resolution. So then that voxel size is adjusted with each iteration so that the resolution of the mesh um, increases as you do more and more iterations. So the way I'm able to control that is by, again by having this iteration counter which I add one to every single frame and then that value goes all the way across and back into the iteration to loop back. So then if you divide that by the number of iterations you're doing you sort of get a progress percentage of how far you've come through your um, repeat node group. And then we can flip that value around by subtracting it from one. So that way when we're starting with the first iteration, the value will be one. And then as we do subsequent iterations, our value will approach zero. It will never actually get to zero because I add one to the iterations. And then just to be fancy, we can run that value through a power node, which if you were to plot all of the values would make a curve rather than being linear. And then that becomes our voxel size, which decreases with each subsequent iteration but we'll never actually get to zero. So then after using the volume nodes to retopologize the mesh, all that's left to do is displace that the result of that um, retopology. And we can do that with a set position node and our Musgrave texture. The way I made the displacement was to take three of those Musgrave loops that we looked at first and to run them into a combine XYZ node to create a vector, then normalize that vector. So what we get are these random directions for each part of the mesh, and, and then you can play with the scale of that texture and stuff. Um, in fact, it would be kind of interesting to maybe adjust that over time as well, so we could plug our value that changes from between 1 and 0. Well, it would probably be better to use this one, right? Because we want to go, we want to start... For this one, we want to start with a small value and then increase it so that it becomes larger. So we could plug our index divided by the number of iterations into a multiplying node to control the final size and then plug that into the scale of our Musgrave vector. So the cool thing about that is adjacent areas of the mesh get the same sort of overall direction, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, their normal direction, which would make the mesh sort of inflate. It can be any random direction. And then I have an additional grayscale Musgrave texture, which is the one we looked at before. Looks like this. And I'm using that value to control the scale of the vector, which we're then using as the offset of the set position node to distort the mesh. Then there's a little bit of control for that. Um, with this displacement value, you can control how much displacement gets added. The higher you make the number, obviously, the more um, distorted the mesh becomes. What you can do instead is make your displacement value a lot smaller, which means you won't destroy the mesh. So you can make it, say, 20 or something. And then over repeated iterations, the sum of those displacements will make larger distortions in the mesh, but in a way that doesn't destroy or stretch the geometry so much. So if we have this at 20 and then we set it to four iterations, it won't be quite as extreme as the 80, but you can definitely see it pushing out and making interesting shapes. So then if we were to set the number of iterations to three, you'll see a lot more uh, remnants of sort of the hexagon patterns, which I think actually looks cooler. I prefer three iterations to four. You could, if you wanted the high resolution, make the iterations four probably, and then adjust the number of times you did the hexagon retopology to three. We're experimenting here. I kind of feel like now it preserves maybe a little too much of the hexagon shapes. I still feel like my favorite of all of them was uh, three iterations. It's also faster. I don't know. It's just interesting. You can make all kinds of cool stuff with it. So then besides that, all I'm doing here is I'm creating some attributes to use in the shader. And um, what I have for that is I, I'm storing the edge angle on the points, and I, I blurred it a little bit, which is probably optional, but I think it gives a little bit better result. And what I'm doing with the angle value in the shader is sort of using the convex bits to 
uh, like highlight on the corners and stuff. And then in the concave bits, I'm adding sort of a green shadow to darken those. And then I'm also saving the Musgrave texture that I use as sort of the scale control for the random direction as a value just to use as sort of the basis for the texture. Other than that, I just set the material to the rock and then create a UV map so that I can use um, textures on it. If you take a look at the shader, I have that angle attribute come in. I split it into two parts, the positive half and the negative half. Um, the positive ha half goes into the Slighten node, where I just lighten the texture a little bit, and then the negative part gets inverted and controls this Multiply node, which adds this green in the concave parts. And then the Displace attribute goes into this Mix node, which takes the input texture here and just darkens it a little bit, controlled by that Displacement texture. I also use that inverted as the roughness, and then I just use the UV map that got created, which is pretty messy. Actually, there's really no reason to use this because um, you wouldn't really want to export this anyway. You'd want to create a copy of the shape and bake the textures onto it. So it'd probably be better to use the triplanar mapping um, on like the object. So where you add texture coordinates, texture coordinate, use like the object coordinates or something, and then run that into, um, box projection would give you a much better result probably. Much finer result. So then you want to run that into a scale. Maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.3, I don't know, something like that. Or you could just forget about that entirely and just use some simple colors and mix those together. So anyway, that's sort of what I've been experimenting with, trying to figure out these repeat zones and stuff. Um, seems like a lot of things you might want to do, um, you can just do with a mesh line and the index node, and that's probably faster than using the repeat zone. But if you want to be able to change what's being done in an operation over um, each iteration, or it's a case where the only way to do it would be previously would have been to duplicate a node group, like five times and then chain them all together, then the repeat zone um, makes it just easier to do that, basically. So yeah, those are my thoughts so far. I'll upload this file to my Blender experiments if you want to experiment with it a bit. But anyway, that's all I've got for this one. Hopefully you found it interesting, and thanks for watching.